holistic nutrition. Um, and I studied at Rhodes Wellness College. So through this program, I've learned a lot about holistic health and looking at the person as a whole. There's been, because of COVID, a lot of online um, stuff going on. So that's kind of how I did my schooling as well. And I was born and raised in St. John. Um, my parents are from Egypt. So that's a little little intro of, of me. Thanks. Thank you. OK. The next person, it's a new. It's new, can you hear me? Okay, whoever that is I'm ready to introduce, please go ahead. The next person, please. Seems to me is not ready. Yeah, Okay, go ahead. Oh. Hi, um, so my name is Titi Lokwe Musuru. Um, I live in Moncton, um, New Brunswick, but I'm originally from Nigeria. Um, I moved, I think I, migra I migrated in 2016, and I currently work for TD Bank. A um, little fun fact about me, um, I just like, I like to read, um, and that's all I do, read and sleep. So <laughs> that's me. Okay, thank you. Next person. We don't have any direct order, please. Any other person that is ready? Okay, um, my name is Sasha James. I am living in Moncton, New Brunswick also. Um, I am a trauma specialist, I'm a counselor. Uh, therapist, I work online, and um, I help individuals who experience uh, workplace trauma, um, life trauma, and I also do addictions counseling. So happy to be here. Thank you. Mm. Next person. I should go next. Okay. Hi, good to see you, and nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Carla Marti Corina. I am working from St. John. I am a newcomer originally from El Salvador, uh, and uh, currently I have a role as community coordinator at CBTEC St. John, which is a special project of the Human Development Council. So thanks for, for organizing this, and uh, pleasure to meet you all. Thank you. Is anyone left? Hi everyone, thank you for Yes, hi, um, my name is Georgie. Um, I'm in St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, I'm international student advisor. Um, I support international students and their families um, here on campus. Um, I work at Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, in addition, I'm also a certified Canadian counselor. Um, so I offer uh, supportive counseling to our students and their spouses as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I guess I can go next. My yes. name is uh, Nanai Belanger. I am an international immigration um, advisor also at Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador, but I currently live in Riverview, New Brunswick, so I'm a virtual employee. And my job at the institution is to work with um, our, our international students and their families and support all of their immigration and transition needs when they come to Canada. Thank you so much. Okay, next question. Next person. Hi everyone. Um, I guess I will go. I, I missed a little the beginning part, but I'm Lydia Sequera, uh, and I'm here. Um, I think I'll be speaking in a couple moments, so it's lovely to hear all of you um, and meet you all. And I'm based in uh, Toronto. I work at Infoway and uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and I'm a researcher. Thank you. 
So is there another one left that is yet to introduce myself? Please, if you are yet to do that, you can just introduce yourself. Is anyone left? Um, we have, okay. All right, I guess we have all introduced ourselves. There's no other one left. So I um, would like to, uh, we have um, uh, quite a number of people here present here as well. I believe um, very soon the camera will be um, um, showing others that are in person for you all to also see. So perhaps when we get to that point, we may have to get them to also introduce themselves. I don't know, um, please, is, is the camera, I don't know, the introduction, yeah, who that are in person? Oh, okay, all right. So um, right now we're going to um, start by, you know, taking our opening remark. I would like to welcome the president of the BDPN. Um, I'd like to hear how to give us our opening remark. So let's put our hands together for our guns. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming today. I believe it's all about our speakers today because um, I am not a mental health awareness expert and I am here to learn as much as everyone is right here. But the thing is, as we all know, there is a um, the part of mental health that people tend to see is the, is the stigmatized narrative, right? So we want to start talking about how we can, you know, um, use the digital health space wisely since this is a, a digital health week uh, celebration. We want to understand the link between uh, digital health support, how it has impacted positively, you know, in changing the narratives, in supporting, you know, people who need care, people who need that access to information, not necessarily care in the, in the grand scheme of things. So that is the reason why this event uh, became a reality. And I also want to recognize the effort of a youth, of a youth advocate here in Malti. She was actually the idea and the brain behind this project. And that's ETH. I got talking to this mentee some two years ago and um, there was a project that she was working on and it kind of surprised me and not really surprised me, kind of encouraged me to say, if youth in this era are already looking at you know, the aspects of mental health and they are really taking it you know, seriously within the scope or within the confine of their environment, trying to just do things that um, the community sees as worthy, I felt like, okay, if our youth are doing this, we should be able to... Uh, to take this seriously because the youth are the next generation. And I am glad she's here today. Uh, by the time we call upon her, she talk about her previous projects and where she's taken this idea into. And um, on this note, I would like to appreciate our, our um, the, the, the reason why this project became successful and that's TD uh, Bank Group. TD actually saw something in what we're doing and it, this is in alignment with their uh, corporate social responsibility on local needs. So we see that uh, mental health is no respect of pressing. And this is also in alignment with uh, what TD Bank Group is, is supporting in our communities. And I'm also glad that we have a representative of TD in our own, uh, in our own capacity today as a professional, talking about you know, how working with TD Bank has been like in terms of also how our contribution to the community has been for her. So um, thank you, everyone. We also want to appreciate the Canada Health Info Way, uh, Professor Lydia Sepira, for you know coming through um, virtually all the way from the University of Toronto. We say thank you. We look forward to all the presentations from Dr. Sunde Abanta from uh, Pure Gold Foundation and everybody that you know have uh, one way or the other contributed to this uh, event. So we hope that we make things easy through interaction virtually. And them in person. Thanks everyone again for coming and we hope to have a good time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, like John for that um, welcome speech. We appreciate that so much. And she has given us a, a little bit of what we're going to be expecting here today from this program. Now um we're going to be um, inviting our shuttle will invite our first speaker for today. But before we do that, I would like to just say a little, a little bit about um, what we're really doing here today. Mental health 
it's, it's becoming um, an increasing issue, especially among the youth and um, um, even the, the, the elderly, the workspace everywhere. And um, it's, it's an issue because it's affecting not just the individual, it's affecting the workspace. It's affecting even our families. It's affecting everyone that is connected to us because if someone is suffering from mental health and the person is connected to you, you're not going to be happy. So it affects productivity. It affects the, the, the nation. You know? So that is why we're not really not going to take it lightly. And um, this event is looking at creating that awareness. You know, it, it's not just about for the person that is suffering mental health to, you know, look for a way to come out of it. But also for us, how do we treat these people? Because they feel stigmatized a lot of times. And, you know, when someone is feeling stigmatized because of mental health, then recovery becomes more difficult. So um, these are issues that we really need to look at. And uh, it's, it's going to be a two-way thing for the person suffering mental health and for you that is out there that knows that someone is suffering from mental health, what actions are you going to take? So these are a lot of things we're going to be learning today. And um, to, to take us further, I would like to welcome our first speaker for today. And um, she will be talking on, um, she'll be talking on um, her professional journey as, as a black professional, you know, um, here in Canada, what she has gone through and how she, you know, was able to get to where she, she is today. And um, her name is another person, Titilope Mosuru. She's the manager of finance operations at TD. So um, I would like to welcome her to take us from her professional journey as a black professional immigrant here in Canada. Please let's put our hands together. Let's see the chair. Hi. Hi everyone. Um, although I can't see you or be there, um, I'm I'm here virtually and I'm saying hello to everyone. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about my professional experience in Canada, um, and I'll just talk a little bit about my adventures, my adventure in learning, growth, and how TD has supported me in whatever community event I want to be involved in. So I migrated, as I mentioned earlier, um, I migrated, can everyone hear me? Okay. So I migrated to Canada back in 2016 and um, I came to study in UNB St. John, Canada. Um, upon completion of my MBA program in 2017, the ultimate question begins, you need to find a job. Um, at that time, I kind of said to myself, okay, I'm new in this country, but I don't want to be in a job that I'm not happy with. So I set out to look for specific jobs that were tailored to my skills. Um, so I started my career in St. John, um, a company called CGS at that time, 2017. And then fast forward to six months, um, I saw an ad. Um, I think it was even in April, April 2018. So I saw an ad online saying TD Bank was going to open a finance operation center in Moncton. And at that time, I said, oh, man, there are going to be so many people applying for this job. There's no way I'm going to get through the door. I didn't apply, and I just closed that news. Um, sometime in September 2018, um, I had a recruiter reach out to me on LinkedIn and then she said, hey, Titi, um, I don't know if you've ever thought of TD. I'm looking at your profile. It interests me and I would like you to apply for an opportunity with TD. And I said, hey, maybe this is God speaking to me. I'm going to take a leap of faith and I'm going to apply. I applied and the rest is history. So I joined TD in January 2019 as part of the first set that what that, 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 that launched the TD Finance Operations Center in Moncton. And I, I literally can tell you that's been one of the best decisions I've ever taken in my life. Um, I started way back as an analyst. Um, and today I've risen to the ranks of finance manager supervising a team of 15. Um, and that's a little bit about my professional experience. I would say something I've learned over the years is commitment, hard work, and dedication gets you results and gets you um, notified, um, not notified, well, gets you noticed and you definitely would get rewarded with putting all of those hard work and commitment in. Um, so 
in terms of learning, I would say TD has been very, like it's been a company for me that I see myself staying in another 10, 15 years. Um, I've had so many learning opportunities, either it be training videos or documentations on how to improve a process. And there's been opportunities for me to add value um, and get rewarded. So it's been everything I am looking for. Um, and I've been able to achieve my career um, goals in there. Regardless of whatever community event or whatever so not whatever event or whatever community you support, there would always be a group um, to help you and make sure where well, TD as a company is supporting your um, community passion or community, um, what's it called? Your, what you're passionate about. So that's a little bit about my professional experience in Canada and TD. Um, I don't want to bore you too much and I'm not going to talk too much, uh, but I'm available for questioning if there is any and thank you for inviting me. I look forward to questioning if there are any. Oh, I think you're on mute. I cannot hear you. Thank you so much, Titi. We're, we're happy and glad to hear your story. And I believe uh, it's, it has encouraged someone here. You know, so thank you so much. Please, let's put our hands together. Yeah. 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 Have a question. If you have a question, I think um, you have an opportunity to ask her. Is there any question? People online, if you also have a question online, you could just go ahead. No question. So um, we're going to be going to the next. Okay, okay. We have a question online. Yes. Hi there. Um, it's uh, Denai Belanger again. Um, I have a question for you. So a lot of the work that I do is working with um, young adults. So so uh, new graduates who are entering the workforce. And a lot of the things that I hear from them is the uh, almost emotional baggage and emotional challenge they have in entering the workforce, especially as people of color and especially if they are black. And I want to know from you um, what you found helped you to get into, um, well, to get out there into the workforce and some of the challenges that you had to overcome as a black professional working in Canada. Okay, to be very honest, I wouldn't say I've had a lot of challenges um, as a black professional in Canada. I've been very fortunate to work with people that um, didn't treat me as a black person, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of mental health, um, everyone is definitely going to go through um, that mental health stage at some point in time, but you have to always do what's best for you. Um, for me, I find that if I'm getting to that point, I take a break from work or I just do whatever makes me happy, maybe travel, just take time off work, rest. Um, I just, I, I take time off work because regardless, work is always going to be work. If you drop dead today, someone's going to pick your job tomorrow. So what I've always said to myself is you have to always put yourself first, regardless of what the situation is. And I've been very blessed to work with organizations that also put that or take that as a priority. So I wouldn't say I've encountered a lot of challenges as a black person in terms of getting into the workforce or maybe being treated in a certain way. I've just been very fortunate. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you okay. so much for your perspective. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, please, do we still have another question? Online, in person? Any other question? Okay. So I guess we don't have any other one. Um, we, we understand that uh, the president of BDVN, like I talked about TD. TD is the sponsor of this uh, event. So um, along the line, as we go on with this program, 
from time to time, we're still going to be talking about how TD has really been helping, especially newcomers, to settle here in Canada. Now, I would just like to point out something. TD is working with community groups to support newcomers and help to ensure they are set up for success. You know, we know that supporting these programs can help newcomers feel adjusted, just like what we're having now. You know, um, if you're new in Canada and you're getting them to know about some of these events, it can help you to settle down here in Canada. So it helps to get them well adjusted and integrated into their local communities, which in turn helps them thrive and you know contribute to their communities as well and to be more resilient. So um, this um, this is a word from um, Tara Lynn and the senior vice president, Greater Ontario TD Bank. This is what um, the message that TD has for us today. So I would like us to understand that and um, to take us further. Um, we go into the next um, presentation. The next presentation, and um, this next presentation will be looking at a topic: how digital health can help transform or create a better experience in mental health awareness, prevention, and care. So, and uh, the person that will be taking us in this uh, topic is Dr. Lydia Sipera. And she's the postdoc. She's a postdoc fellow at Canada Health Inquiry and the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. She's someone that is specialized in this uh, um, field, so she has. She's coming with a lot of knowledge, you know, to help us understand uh, issues around mental health. So I would like us to welcome Dr. Lydia Shibera. Please let's put our hands together. Is on that. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so excited to be here um, and talk a little bit about uh, digital mental health. That's my passion. Um, I'm just waiting to see if I could share screen. It says host um, has disabled screen sharing. So maybe I'll give it one moment. I have a few slides to just um, go along with the, the talk. Sure, that I'm even a host. Oh, awesome. OK. No. Okay, so hopefully this is okay and everyone can see the slides. Can I see maybe just a quick thumbs up from someone? Okay, awesome. Great, so um, as you heard, my name is Lydia Sequera and I'm a mental health research fellow um, at Canada Health InfoWay. Um, if you haven't heard of Canada Health InfoWay before, we are a pan-Canadian nonprofit and the uh, mission and vision is really focused on uh, integrating digital health into the healthcare experience for all Canadians. And so I have a dual role, as you've also heard. Uh, I'm also a researcher at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, or CAMH, uh, as we call it. And I will acknowledge uh, that there is lots of work that I'll be talking about today um, that I have many, many collaborators on, both at InfoWay and CAMH. Uh, and I'm also funded by CIHR and AMS Healthcare. So just to get us started, as we are approaching the almost three-year mark now uh, of the, the pandemic in North America, um, the impact really that the pandemic measures have had on each individual varies. Uh, however, some of the specific measures that were put in place um, to kind of slow this virus spread um, has really had changes to our workplace environments, you know, schooling, closures in childcare uh, and childcare facilities, um, social and physical distancing measures, and all kind of leading to burnout, fatigue, and lots of uncertainty. And all of these uh, issues have inadvertently caused an echo pandemic of declining mental health. So we've seen rises in anxiety, depression, and other mental health conditions. And uh, there was a pan-Canadian survey that was conducted much earlier this year by CAMH, and it's kind of updated on a regular basis. Um, and these are some of the numbers that came out of that survey. So, you know, 25% experience uh, moderate to severe anxiety, and this is for uh, a large uh, population or sample of Canadians. Uh, 25 reported in engaging um, in binge drinking in the past seven days since the survey was done. Uh, there was loneliness and there was depression as well. So this survey data really kind of highlights 
um, you know, where some of the challenges are currently and what the challenges that were brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic really, really have affected. And then there's also increasing effects of indi individuals um, that are experiencing post-COVID conditions or long COVID, um, commonly, you know, reporting impacts on their mental health and including some of those same conditions that we've seen um, in, the, in the previous survey. So anxiety, depression, and even uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so where are people supposed to access care or what does this continuum of mental health care delivery really look like? Um, so on the kind of lower end, you have, you know, more low intensity care. Uh, so there's therapy, there's counseling, and uh, not forgetting that some of these, ther the, these therapy or, or counseling sessions can also be done for very acute um, individuals or uh, individuals acuting more kind of acute mental health uh, conditions. But just on the, on the broad spectrum, um, you know, there's low intensity care, there's some private practice, psychotherapists or psychologists, um, or social workers and many other therapists working there. Um, then there's some community-based care. Uh, there's social services, uh, mental health and addiction service clinics like the Canadian Mental Health Association. Then there's a lot of mental health care delivery that happens in primary care clinics um, and family health teams. Um, and then finally on the end, the other end, uh, we have more acute care delivery um, uh, for mental health care and treatment. So the, the place I'm at is an academic uh, mental health care hospital. So essentially everything, all care and all delivery there is focused on mental health. Um, our emergency department is a mental health emergency department, but there's lots of uh, mental health care delivery just done in you know, a variety of emergency departments across Canada as well. So this is kind of the continuum. Um, of course, noticing um, or noting, as I said earlier, that there's, you know, all kinds of care happening at all of these different uh, buckets. And usually on some of the um, private practice or, you know, psychotherapy and, and counseling sessions, uh, Canadians still have to pay a lot out of pocket for accessing services through either private insurance plans or, um, you know, finding their own way to, to kind of cover for this care because it's not, uh, fully covered by our Canada Health Act. And then the acute care or some of the primary care mental health uh, delivery services are publicly funded um, and treatment is focused on, you know, getting medical care to those deemed medically necessary. Um, so because of that med medically necessary clause and the limited amount of those higher uh, versions of, of uh, care we have, there is uh, definitely an access to mental health care issue. Um, and I wanted to highlight just given um, the context of uh, this specific day today um, and, and the uh, Black Business Professional Network, there was a, um, an article that was published by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. So they're a close collaborator of InfoA and they're another uh, Pan-Canadian healthcare organization that basically all they do is focus on mental health uh, and awareness and, and prevention. Um, and so they published this uh, pretty recently in 2021, uh, talking about just the lower use of mental health services uh, within Black Canadian residents. Um, and they've kind of, pro you know, given some, some survey data as well um, to, to reflect this. And they talk about systemic inequity um, due to long wait times in specific populations uh, or just the, the, the availability of fewer mental health programs and services that are available in these communities. So this brings me to um, the question that I had, you know, as, um, as kind of the overarching question for my presentation here today is, you know, that we, we know that there is an, an increasing number of mental health conditions um, across Canada today, and we know that there is an access issue. So how can we actually use digital help to improve mental health uh, awareness, prevention, and care through using these, these digital tools? And so just to level the playing field here, I know you're celebrating Digital Health Week, so I'm sure most folks in the room um, and online might know 
the concept of digital health, but I thought I'd just quickly put it here uh, to acknowledge, you know, digital health, when we're talking about digital health, it really refers to um, this entire umbrella of information technology and services and processes to support healthcare delivery and outcomes. Um, and here on the right, you can see, um, I like this visual and it's, I think it's kind of, uh, in the last year published sometime in the last year, uh, but they talk about just the variety of applications and, and types of technologies that fall within digital health. So digital health can really include anything from electronic health records. So when you go into your mental health care provider um, and they're taking notes, um, those clinical notes then become part of your electronic health record. So that can be consist, uh, considered um, digital health, so that technology, um, anything from mobile apps, and that's what I uh, do a lot of work in, um, how can we kind of use mobile apps to support care or to support treatment. Um, and you can see here, there's a plethora of other, you know, everything from personal health uh, devices to even just telemedicine. So things offered virtually all kind of fall under this bucket uh, of digital health. And when we think about digital and mental health, um, which is the area I work in, um, or e-mental health, as you may have heard, this is really a branch of digital health. Um, and it's in place um, and it's growing uh, and getting more traction. Um, and this is a, a definition and a promise, I guess, from the Mental Health Commission of Canada that e-mental health is really, you know, hopefully if implemented well and used well and, and you know, made aware of can deliver timely, effective mental health services by using some of these internet based or related technologies. So what does a digital mental health landscape look like in Canada? Um, and we have a I've kind of linked here. Um, happy to share some of these links um, in the chat as well after. Um, but we had a, a pretty cool podcast uh, podcast episode. InfoWay does a, a podcast called InfoCast, and they talk about every um, digital health, you know, challenge or, or concept out there. Um, and they did a, a podcast specifically on digital mental health and, and more specifically about mental health in your pocket. So using smartphones to improve mental health. Uh, so I've linked it there, but we kind of talked about this landscape uh, of digital mental health in that podcast. So, you know, when you're thinking about the, the plethora of ways that uh, mental health is delivered digitally. Um, if a primary care office or a psychiatrist or specialty, specialty care has transitioned to virtual care offerings, uh, you know, maybe full time or maybe some, some part of the time, that's considered digital mental health. Um, then there are tertiary facilities who have transitioned to virtual care like CAMH. A lot of care is also offered virtually now or a lot of the group programs uh, or counseling programs are, are offered virtually. Um, then there are some community organizations um, such as the Canadian Mental Health Association that offer virtual services. And I've linked out here um, or have uh, an example of something that um, went live in New Brunswick as well. So they're going from province to province and it's called uh, the Bounce Back um, Initiative. So I'd really you know, suggest that you look at some of these resources if you maybe haven't uh, checked them out before because everything you know, put on here um, is kind of government built or funded. Um, so they're validated and they're developed with evidence-based um, mechanisms and evidence-based uh, therapy basically. So that's bounce back, that falls under that community organization that went virtual or that offered uh, virtual services. And then we have a whole bunch of government funded e-mental health programs. So uh, there's Kids Help Phone uh, and uh, Canada Health InfoWay has invested in multiple different projects uh, that Kids Help Phone has done. Um, there's Wellness Together Canada. So this is a huge joint kind of consortium uh, between Stepped Care Canada um, and Kids Help Phone and a few other really big mental health players, specifically the mental health players. Um, and so that's a portal that's free for everyone to use. Um, and you can kind of go in and depending on the type of care or the level of care that you need, you will be triaged uh, appropriately. 
Then we have Bridge the Gap, which is similar. Um, it's, it's similar to the, the One Us Together kind of model. Um, but I would really kind of suggest take a look and browse through and see what's out there in some of these different digital mental health um, tools um, that are available for everyone. And in Ontario here, we have something called Together All, and it's slowly spreading across to all Canadians. Most uh, students and universities actually have uh, a free kind of on, uh, uh, free uh, log in to Together All. So if you do, you know, you're part of a university or if you're able to get this at uh, this login, um, take that, take a look at that and, and check it out as well. Um, and then you have private e-mental health providers. So uh, if you've heard of BetterHelp or Inkblot Therapy, um, these are kind of, you know, you pay per use or you pay uh, per session. Uh, but they also kind of are very important in our digital mental health landscape. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of self-management tools uh, through apps or mobile apps or web apps um, that you can use to manage your digital mental health. And we'll talk about those in a, in a quick second. Um, so InfoWay does a lot of, in, in addition to investing in e-mental health um, initiatives, we also do a lot of data collection and essentially serve as this rich data hub. Um, all of the data is available for everyone to kind of look at and you can look at trends over the last many years, specifically around digital, digital health or digital mental health use. Um, so this is some of our survey data from the last couple of years, we uh, survey individuals on their self-reported, so they're telling us uh, what they think about their mental health. Um, and so you can see that, you know, since 2009, uh, 2019, sorry, pre-COVID, um, the the excellent and the the very good have have kind of shortened um, uh, since 2009 over the past two years, and we're now actually collecting. As we speak in, in these couple of months, collecting the 2022 data. So when that's available, it'll also be available on our website. So if you look up InfoA um, Insights, um, you, you'll be able to actually pull out this data for yourself and, and look through whatever you're interested in. And in the, in the survey, we ask about e-mental health use as well. And uh, this is just an important statistic that I wanted to bring up because um, there's over half of the Canadians that are sampled uh, or, you know, are actually participate in the survey say that they're interested in accessing e-mental health services. But when you look at the number who have actually used it ever in their lifetime or, you know, within the last 12 months, it's a very, very small number. So there's this huge discrepancy between people who are interested in accessing uh, versus people who have actually used it. Um, and even smaller than the 10% is the number who have used it in the, 12, uh, in the last 12 months. And some of the benefits of those who have used e-mental health services, so remember that very small number is still, um, you know, they are showing some benefits in terms of they were satisfied with the, the care that they received. Um, you know, 74% said that it uh, prevented self-harm. 63% um, said they would not have sought care if virtual options were not available. So that's an important number to think about. Um, and, and then 77% uh, said it avoided a uh, in-person visit. So these are all numbers, again, from that same survey. Um, and then this was a another uh, study that was done by some really close colleagues of mine at CAMH, so uh, Nelson Shen and Iman Kassam and a few other folks there. And they asked uh, Canadians, so a different sample of Canadians, but still a large Canadian sample. Um, you know, they were understand, they were trying to understand, okay, people use and they're interested in digital mental health, but uh, what are the priorities? And um, the, the top digital mental health priorities, you know, are listed here. They wanted secure messaging with their providers. Um, but then a lot of it talked about, I just want to be able to navigate and curate. You know, there are so many different programs, like I've just kind of highlighted in the, in the previous few slides. How do I know what's right for me? And how do I kind of do that evaluation? Uh, and how do I go about finding some of these? 
So this is kind of what nicely transitions to one of the projects that our team at CAMH um, had done over COVID um, and kind of focusing on, I'll talk a little bit about how we can use digital health to improve mental health awareness. Um, and then I'll talk about um, mental health prevention and then mental health care. So in terms of awareness, uh, thinking about, you know, that survey statistic or, or priority of people wanting to actually have curation tools. Um, so this was a, a project that we had done in the very kind of beginning uh, part of COVID. It was a short six month project, but it's kind of stayed on. Um, and we really tried to synthesize and mobilize this knowledge related to all of the different interventions that were out there that could support the population with their mental health, uh, both during the, the pandemic early, early years and after. And this is um, you know, our slide that we had back then with very hopeful that we would one day come out of this knowing that uh, now looking back, we're still very much in this pandemic. And so I've also linked here um, what our entire report contains. So it's much, we did a, a literature review and we have some more results in there, but I wanted to just highlight and talk about uh, here today, the, the literature search and uh, the environmental scan. So we were looking at, you know, where uh, in the literature or where um, in the gray literature, so Googling and, um, and other resources, both academic and non-academic, uh, and also looking at app stores and curated app libraries. So what are tools that we can use within Canada um, to actually support uh, mental health? Um, and this was because access to mental health care in the early pandemic, and it's continued since then, um, is challenging. So your traditional, you know, it's hard to find a family doctor to then get a referral, um, or most places that needed referrals had really long wait times. Um, so this was kind of looking at what else do we have currently um, that we can use to, to kind of get us by or get us through until we are able to meet with um, a, a professional. Um, and some of these tools actually do connect you with a professional, so there's quite a wide variety. Um, this is where we, we got all of the information. So there were only two um, pieces or, or technologies that we found from the academic literature. We found a lot of really cool um, research that was going on, but either that the, the tool was still in development or the, the tool was only in development uh, or only in use by people within a specific research study. So it wasn't really available to the entire population. Um, so there were two that came from there. Um, and then there were quite a few that came from looking at app stores and curated libraries. Uh, and then a lot more web-based or mobile app tools that we got from, uh, from our, um, uh, environmental or sorry gray literature uh, scan and then we asked professionals we asked um, people with lived experience you know what are some of the tools that you've been using uh, and we also included some additional resources from there so these are just the numbers of where we got all of these these different tools from um, so we ended up with um, I'm just gonna hit play here while I talk but we ended up with uh, this database that uh, I will show you on the next slide where you can find it. So it's available to, for everyone to use. And because we, we did create it back in, um, in 2020, um, so we're hoping, you know, we haven't really gone back and redone some of the searches now, but we're hoping a lot of them are still relevant. Um, and we're able to, you're able to go into this database and kind of sort and filter by population. So if you're looking for youth versus adult, um, by area of Canada, um, you know, what's available in specific areas, um, by cost, so what the free app versus not. Um, there's web-based resources and there's also mobile app resources. So this is kind of answering that question to, you know, how can we better curate the variety of apps and uh, or programs that, that exist in the digital um, mental health space. Um, and you can kind of go in and click and, and look through, you know, a ton of resources that are, are available on there. Um, and, uh, sorry, and this is actually where you can 
um, access it. So if you just kind of type in digital COVID and mental health resource list, it's on our uh, CAMH website. Uh, but I'm once again, happy to actually send you the, the direct links. Uh, I'm really realizing now that I should have had many QR codes, so it might be easier to, uh, to scan through, but I, I'm happy to send in some of these links after as well. Um, and we really tried to, so there's two sort of libraries. One is for websites and then one is for, um, for mobile apps and resources. Um, and there's also, you can print out these lists if um, there are specific, you know, populations that you're supporting that don't have access to um, a tablet or, or smartphone or any sort of um, technology because there are within this list, you know, some of the things are phone based or, or telephone based. So they don't necessarily require a smartphone. Um, and you're able to actually look, look at that as well uh, or look for which specific type um, of resource you're looking for. Um, and what we did when we were putting in, so like I said, there were two different um, libraries. One is the app-based library and one was the, the web-based. So for the apps, we actually used this, um, um, this database that I've linked out here, but also the American Psychiatric Association app evaluation framework. Um, so we've kind of included versions uh, of this framework where we've kind of applied this framework on all of the apps that we've included in our uh, database to be able to help people make a more informed decision about the type of things that they're downloading or the type of intervention that they're, they're going to be accessing. So we've done some, some of the evaluation work, um, but for the, the websites, we linked people to this. Um, once again, the Mental Health Commission of Canada has um, this you know, quick and dirty five piece app checklist to, to think about evaluating any tool. So it can be a digital mental health tool, but even digital health tools in general, um, you know, about, you know, the where did it come from and who created it and kind of think systematically about the type of thing that you're downloading or the type of tool that you're accessing here. Um, now I wanted to quickly switch gears to talking about how digital health can improve mental health uh, prevention. So that was an example of awareness and, and how we've done some of the curation work. Um, talking about prevention, so this is some uh, a project that I've worked on with uh, many folks at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, um, and it's the Hope by CAMH app, and I, I do have a QR code here, so uh, if you scan that, it'll take you to our um, main web page on, on landing page at uh, CAMH.ca, and you can download the app from there for either smartphone. Um, but this is a free smartphone um, that provides suicide prevention information and tools and crisis supports and resources uh, to guide individuals when they're experiencing thoughts of suicide, but also outside of this uh, specific time. And the background and rationale for building this um, is that best practice strategies for suicide prevention include safety planning, um, you know, having access to crisis resources near and, and close by, and then also education for both individuals and their families. Um, and um, there are barriers, so usually safety planning is done uh, with this paper, pen and paper manner, but sometimes that safety plan is misplaced or people don't always have it on them. But most people nowadays, you know, have a smartphone on them, not necessarily saying that this applies to the entire population, but it's kind of meant to be, um, this digital tool is meant to be an option for those who prefer that, um, not kind of forgetting that there are still going to be, uh, you know, members of our population who prefer pen and paper, and that's totally fine as well. It's just providing uh, an, another option. Um, and so we, we thought that sharing knowledge and tools through smartphones, uh, it's shown to be feasible through other literature and through other mental health um, examples. And so we thought that, you know, we would, we would uh, create this and, and see how we can actually integrate this into uh, provider and patient workflows, essentially. And this is what it looked like. So the idea was generated back in 2019, um, the initial kind of content and design using best practices around suicide safety planning was done in 2020. And the, the app was launched in uh, 2020, October. And 
We've essentially implemented it across a few clinics at CAMH, but also it's available to anyone. Um, we've done a lot of awareness um, sessions just focused on the app um, to, you know, social work and, and employment services and really anyone who might think that this might be a helpful tool for their population. And throughout the process, and now I'm kind of uh, evaluating and doing some research on the usefulness of the app. Um, so we've consulted with clinical experts at CAMH, uh, patients and family members, legal, our privacy and uh, security as well. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. My laptop just went into power saving mode. Okay. All right, I'm gonna try this once more. Um, okay, hopefully this works. All right. Sorry about that. I'm not actually sure what happened. Um, that's the first time that that's happened to me. Um, but it seems like I'm okay now. Okay. So um, what I was gonna say is, yeah, so that, that was kind of the, the app development process. And um, this is what our, um, our app looks like when you download it. So there's, it's pretty simple. There's four different parts to it, uh, a safety plan, resources, wellness activities, and uh, a general information section. Um, and we've had since 2020, October, um, you know, quite a few downloads and we have an ongoing research study. And we're also integrating this into care within different clinics at CAMH. And so we do that via these um, quality improvement plan, do, study, act cycles. Uh, and in terms of some preliminary results, uh, people have been saying through surveys um, uh, that, you know, the app has increased their knowledge of safety planning. Uh, it's increased um, or affected their mental health positively. It's encouraged them to help uh, to um, access help seeking when necessary or when in crisis because they have access to resources. There's also on the app a one-touch kind of safety button that connects individuals either to 911, but more, um, I mean, um, um, we're, we're trying to get people to, to maybe get connected to the suicide prevention um, line um, through, through the actual app, because that's often a number, at least till now, there's no three digit number and that's a number that's hard to memorize. Um, so that's really, there's a one touch button within the app for now. Um, and so this was some of the, the qualitative data that we found from interviewing participants who have been using the app. And they thought that the safety planning prompts were helpful. They prompted self-reflection. Um, and then the individuals also found some of those other sections of the app, like the journaling section, um, almost you know, helpful during mental health treatment because they used to keep a, this particular um, participant at least, kept almost a note of, of things to talk to their psychiatrist about, for example. And we do have on our website um, an integration into care toolkit. So this is just posters, education material on using the app, on what some of the functionalities are. Uh, and we're finding even though we, we began um, thinking about, you know, suicide prevention and more of the prevention aspect, people are using it more for wellness and using it, using the wellness activities on a more regular basis than any of the other sections of the app. Um, so feel free, again, to, to take a look and the, the toolkit is there and you can download it um, as well. And, and there's posters and such. If you do practice in a mental, mental health care setting or a primary care setting, you're free to, to put some of those up. And then just to, to kind of close off, is thinking about how digital health can improve, you know, mental health care and treatment. So the example I showed you for uh, prevention also, I think, applies here. 
There are other tools that are not in the e-mental health care realm. Um, so Ca Canada Health Infoway has a tool called Prescribe It, um, and this is essentially an e-referral system. So it's trying to connect um, providers to uh, different pharmacies through an electronic manner. Uh, and we're finding that you know there, it's safer and it's more efficient in terms of medication management. Um, especially during mental health care when there's often multiple transitions of care. So you're going from community care uh, to, you know, a one-off virtual um, uh, program to then maybe family care and then maybe a, a more specialist care like a psychiatrist. So there's lots of transitions of care. Um, and that's where, you know, if you're on multiple medications specifically for uh, certain mental health disorders, um, there can be overlap or difficulties in remembering this or, or you know, misprescription. Um, so this is where a tool like, like Prescribe It, which is just a general uh, digital health tool, can also be very applicable in um, the mental health field. Um, and then I did some work around clinical decision support. So thinking back to the technology of electronic health records, um, these are some quotes that I was, uh, I interviewed uh, clinicians who, who conducted suicide risk assessment. And I said, you know, how can technology help you in your workflow, in your treatment? And they actually said things like, you know, I, I'm often looking for a change in baseline since I last saw my client. Um, so having some sort of trending would be really helpful. Um, you know, another individual or another uh, provider said that there's just so many different documents to look through. And so if technology can actually do some sort of like searching uh, and summarizing for me, that would be really helpful. And then another case manager talked about um, just coordination of care. And oftentimes within mental health care, um, as a social worker, you're often required to do a lot of uh, resource, you know, searching for resources and providing resources to patients. So having some sort of a hub um, for like an access to, you know, just social determinants like food banks and bus passes and all of these things could actually, that don't necessarily always fall within the mental health care sector. So having an easy access to finding some of these resources, um, you know, this individual said that that would actually be um, the best use of technology in their mind. And then this is more coming back to apps because this is somewhere, um, a place that I work in right now. Um, we are also, this is another app uh, called App for Independence or A for I. And it was co-designed by um, um, a colleague, uh, Dr. Sean Kidd at CAMH, along with patients uh, and family members and a company called Memo Text who actually developed this. Um, and this is a really cool, we're doing a really cool pilot right now. Um, and it's meant, it's a platform meant to support uh, the schizophrenia and psychosis recovery process. So we have it implemented in a clinic um, and how it works is patients use the mobile app and um, their clinicians use a portal that's connected. And so they're able to track their mood, uh, their sleep, their goals, and it's really goal oriented care, um, often kind of providing a companion to goal oriented care. So we're trying to see, you know, how people are using it and what the usefulness of this is within care. But I just wanted to bring this up as an example of how, you know, digital mental health is actually improving um, care at CAMH at least and hopefully beyond. Um, so just to conclude, this was a study that we had done pretty recently based on some of the same data that I was talking about earlier, the, the Canadian Digital Health Survey. And we looked at, you know, who actually uses e-mental health from those very small 10% of people. Um, and we are finding that it's people who have, you know, regular family access, uh, or sorry, regular family physician access, uh, people who live in non-rural communities, um, people who have a higher level of education, they're more e-health literate, so they know how to use technology and, and other pieces of health uh, e-health uh, care, and people who speak English at home. So these are kind of these determinants of who is using e-mental health care. And I think the, the conclusion and the next steps um, and the, the impact of the study is really to think about how can we expand the use of mental health care beyond these populations to people uh, who really need it, um, you know, beyond these populations uh, and to maybe are not being able to even 
have an awareness of it or, or even get access to some of these technologies. Um, and I wanted to end with this. Um, it was a really um, interesting article that I'd read posted on the Canada.ca government website. Um, and it was done, it, it, was, it was written based on a conversation uh, with this great policy analyst here at the Public Health uh, Canada. They'd done an interview and, and um, written about it there that I saw. And, and I think this comes down to if we're building uh, and implementing or designing um, e-mental health technologies, we have to make sure that we're thinking about, you know, how we do this in a culturally appropriate and culturally tailored way, because then we can hopefully access um, and spread e-mental health to those specific populations that currently um, aren't accessing it, but, but might need to or have an interest in accessing it. So I think with that, I will say thank you so much again for having me here. Um, it's been really great uh, meeting you, although virtually. Um, and I have some of my information on here and InfoA's information. Um, and also just a, a quick um, note to say that, you know, the Digital Mental Health Lab, that's my lab at CAMH and my research lab. Uh, feel free to take a, a look through some of the other really cool stuff that lots of my collaborators are working on um, and uh, my supervisor and, and everyone else. So there's all, everything we do really revolves around digital mental health. And we often collaborate with InfoWay, um, even all of my other colleagues, um, for a variety of reasons, a, a lot of time being data, because uh, InfoWay collects really, really rich and, and interesting data in our field. So I am going to stop sharing. Oh, there we go. Awesome, are there any questions or? I will, as I said, put some of those, those pieces um, in, in the chat, hopefully after, um, after this Q&A question, session. Yes, feel free. Yeah, I have a, a, thank you so much. That was a lot of, very informative, very interesting. I took some notes, it was really nice to hear all the input, um, Lydia, so thank you for that. Um, I just get curious about because one of the things I recognize and, and I myself, I, I see the struggle with access to resources, to free resources. Um, there's some I've learned along the way with my own personal kind of experience, um, but it's very limited. There's just a few and even the resources that St. John has kind of this one page form. OK, if you're struggling with family law, this, mm -hmm. that when it's related to mental health. There's kind of like this flow chart. So I'm just curious if there's that kind of thing, because I saw in the on the website, there's this directory and then you can select youth and all this stuff. But what about this one page kind of deal? Is there anything very like, you know what I mean? Because I find personally it can get it can get overwhelming, all these resources and things. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I often think sometimes, honestly, when you know, when you're doing curation, you almost get lost in the availability and the amount of stuff that exists. Um, I would say a good place to start would actually be the Wellness Together Canada portal. Um, I think they have done um, a really, it's really this consortium of multiple different big e-mental health players, and it's funded by, you know, Health Canada. Um, so I would say in, in I really like it because it's not that you, um, you know, go online and do like an electronic triage or anything. It really meets people in every step. So if you're in crisis, you're able to actually speak with a crisis provider. If you don't necessarily want to speak with anyone or you're not ready for that just yet, it gives you access to more, you know, low intensity resources. So I think I would say that's a, a great place to start, just given you know who is funding it and where it's developed. And there are a lot of great researchers. Um, I'm not really affiliated with it in any way, but our lab really always talks about what a great resource it is because it it often shows up um, as as being this thing that not many people know about it. And I'm always like, why? <laughs> so yeah, maybe start there. Thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. Any other questions? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, do you still have any other questions for Lydia? 
I think we have some questions in the chat. We can have them or else come into the chat box. Okay, no questions. Thank you so much, Lydia. No problem. Thanks for having me again. All right, thank you. Bye. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, this is the period where we get to greet and meet one another. But before we go ahead with that, I'll just like to commend each and every one of us, the speakers who have spoken ahead of now, and for those of us that have been able to make it out to this event today. Um, and I would like to say that there is nobody that has. rather not interact with one another. And we hope that we can break that barrier once we meet uh, one another. And we're not leaving out uh, those that are participating online as well. So if uh, you are online, you can put into the chat box, introduce yourself, uh, what do you do? Let people get to know, learn something about you. Might make some great connections this afternoon. So um, starting that, I'd like to introduce myself first of all. My name is Damilola Ajibade. I volunteer as one of the directors with the BBPN. And um, I currently work as a business navigator with Opportunities New Brunswick. Um, other things that I do on the side, I love photography, videography. I love to tell stories using still and uh, uh, moving photos. Um, I'm a wife and a mom of two very cute boys. Uh, what else? Yeah, I just shared some things about myself. So I know that we have some speakers in the room. And for those of us that are here, um, I want us to make it a little fun. So we're going to have to identify who the speakers in this room are. Go get to learn something about them. We'll introduce ourselves to them. And then afterwards, we're going to have all the speakers come to this uh, table, this table or this, okay, to the table right on my left hand side here. Um, and before we start, there's also somebody that I think it's important that we I mean, recognize. I do recognize every person that is here in this room. We appreciate you for coming. Something that we usually don't do um, often is giving ourselves a pat on the back. And that's actually one way that we can improve our mental health, actually commending ourselves. So first of all, I, I recognize us all, including those online. Let's give ourselves a pat on the back for being here. Um, let's tell ourselves our mental health matters and it's important that we're here. Every person that has uh, made it out here today has also made a big statement to tell us how important it is for us to be here. We also have today in our midst, Erika Cantu, who is the local immigration Partnership Manager for the City of Moncton, and we'll also like to welcome you, Erica. And uh, just yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, just once we're done with the uh, meet and greet, I'll also like to have that the speakers and Erica please make it their way to um, the lovely seat that has been uh, set out here for us. So let's get to meet one another. Let's get to learn five different things about each person that is here in the room. We're going to make great connections. And for those online, share something, some fun facts about yourselves. Let's make some connections online. You never know where the connection starts from, right? They say that wherever it is that you are going to is based on the number of people that you have met sometimes at a time in your life. So let's begin to make that connection happen right now. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Hey, I think we've used up our time. Sorry, I did not announce earlier that we had about five minutes to do this. So I believe we've um, been able to interact and for those online as well, have been able to make some really great connections. So um, did anyone identify the speakers that we have in here today? <laughs> Yes, so we'll, we'll give you a, a, a clap, a, a big hand. <laughs> yes, please, can you uh, help us? We have a few Awesome, please, let's give a big hand for identifying one speaker and also let's welcome one of our speakers, Faith Ashabal, here um, to the podium here. Yeah, welcome. We're not. This is part of the mental health event. Let's encourage her. <laughs> Do we have anybody else, any other speaker that we, I said we did have? Okay, yeah. Who wants to identify? I will. Okay, somebody, I thought someone had a hand up. Yes, did, did you identify the other? Yes, please. Yeah, there Okay, yes, please. Let's welcome. <laughs> Sorry. Of course you were. <laughs> You're welcome. Please let's welcome Erica. Okay, we have we have one 
Um, we actually have two other people. I'll introduce the other, the fourth person. Well, we have a third person here who's supposed to be speaking this afternoon. Did we identify her? Okay, yes, please. We, we need to get a kit for you today. <laughs> okay, we're well, waiting. Let's let buy her. We also welcome on you, Lola Shadia Haya. Let's give her a passage. And then we have Atia Imam, who's supposed to join us here as well. She I think. All right. Okay. Um, while we have we have all our speakers here at the um, table here. I want to ask that everybody else moves closer to the front so that when it's easier that we're taking shots, it's, we can capture everybody all in one place. So can we have that? That just helps us. Um, it helps us uh, interact better, you know, and then we can continue the conversations in between. So if I can have everybody or most people move on to this table right on my um, left-hand side here, that would be nice. All right. Okay. Thank you. And I'll um, pass it over to Luna. Thank you. Well, I'm going to put hands together with the family. Um, and again, thank you to our speakers for being here. I, I, I'm sure you are comfortable with your seats right now. Thank you so much. Um, so take us for that. Um, the next item we have today, we've talked about um, um, the um, presentation that was made by Lydia Sequera. It was a wonderful presentation. And um, thank you so much, Lydia, for that awesome presentation. And for the interactive section that we have, the questions that followed, we appreciate that so much. And I believe we have all learned a lot from the discussion. Um, next, we'll be inviting Oyilola Oluashem for a presentation on financial literacy. So, um, Oluashem is a financial advisor with a World Financial Group. So, um, put your hands together. Thank you for the honor to be on with my today. I have been introduced by and today makes it exactly two years, nine months, and six days. And I will say it's it's been a journey. Barely two weeks after we landed, the pandemic struck, and everywhere in the world was shut down. But we had to keep navigating. And one major landmark was that journey was when we had to move from Toronto after spending about two years to New Brunswick. And I must say that we like it here already. I am happily married to a wonderful husband who is a medical doctor. Thankfully, he's just completed his round of licensing exams, ready to take on the new opportunities that lies in the Canadian medical world. We are blessed with two amazing children. But so you know, she is in the house today. Can you say that good to her? And we are so good to her. Yes. Nine to five, I am your tech lady. I work in the tech company at the senior system that I'm in. Outside of work hours and doing events, I find me educating my community on how to be financial literate. And then my husband and I co founded an African market recently, so you can also find me attending to her clients. So, enough about me today, we'll go straight into our topic 
how digital financial awareness can improve mental health. And as an introduction, I would like to say that two topics impact every one of us, whether we're interested in it or not. And that is our health and our wealth. And it is no news that the health and the financial industries are both the highest paid industries in the world. And then being financially free, being financially literate, does not have so much to do about how much you earn, but your knowledge of financial world. And then there are some mental and mental health and money statistics. And I find a good number of them very concerning because about half of Canadians reports that money is a daily concern. One out of three Canadians are one month or less from financial crisis. We are just barely getting back. And the big four stresses, we have relationship, work, health, and financial stress. Did you know that financial stress tops that list and outweighs the other stresses? And according to Soul Life Canadian Health Index, it affects at least half of Canadians with no preference to your income or your age groups. And what are the impacts of um, financial stress? When we consider mental health and our financial health, they are closely linked. What keeps us awake at night? Either your health or your wealth. And in times of heightened unemployment, in times of financial strain to the economy, people that are already living with mental health issues can dive more into challenges and sicknesses. And then we start having feelings of anger, of blame, unhealthy work environments, people suffering from heart disease, from high blood pressure, sleep issues, headaches, and the likes. And what are the sources of all of this financial stress? Some people will say Bank of Canada, for one, who had so many interest rates increase in the last few months, just this year alone. And it doesn't affect only our mortgage. I know some people will say, oh, thankfully I got a fixed mortgage rate and I'm kind of free. But no, how about your personal loans? How about your lines of credit, your student loan? The credit card bill that you don't pay for tickets, all of these are affected by the increment. And then, as we are trying to survive and navigate this uncertain time, our finances are becoming thinner by the day. And once any little thing should happen, say maybe you need to take time off to care for a doctor, see, or a temporary separation, anything, mental issues can begin to arise. And then how do we get equipped with the needed financial education? The world has gone digital. And when you are not healthy, you go to the doctors to get treated. So when your finance is not healthy, what should you do? So certified financial education, such as myself, are taking the social media to communicate to people. Find on the streets of Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, just name it. People like me educating the community about how to be financially literate. We organize free seminars, we have webinars, a ton of online resources, and there are mobile applications that you can get on your devices that can help you to budget, to shop smart, and to price much. And then how do you become financially free? My first was to picture a building, and thankfully in Canada, we see how very deep the foundations of buildings go into the soil. And for us to be able to withstand the storms, all of the uncertainties that come with life, we need to actually build a very solid financial foundation. You can see on the screen here at the bottom of that building is protection. And why is it protection? Because without like or without adequate provision, all of the other things would no longer exist. And when I say protection, I'm talking about your life insurance, critical illness insurance, disability, anything that can replace your income 
she would heal the heart of the future. And after you've done that, you manage your debts. After that, you set aside funds for emergency. And the recommendation is that you set aside at least three to six months of what you currently think as emergency. And where do you put this money? If emergency does not go in a year or three, you don't want to come back and meet just maybe six dollars on top of what you've seen. The recommendation is to use a tax sheltered account for your goods and uh, tax receipts account comes in and for that. And finally, when you've done the three bottom things, you can begin to now look for ways to save and invest on the long run. I'd like to ask a question now. What comes to your mind when you hear about life insurance? And I'll have maybe one or two people. Oh, yeah. We don't need to bed right now because we're going to make sure that we're not going to use it, right? But if you open it, you're not going to invest in that moment. But I think we first like, you know, like, that's what I'm going to do. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any other person wants to share what comes to mind when you think about life insurance? Okay, if you don't take anything away today, know that life insurance equals protection. That is how I would call it. And generally in Canada, there are two types. We have the term and the permanent. Erica mentioned that uh, you think it's a no-no because you don't benefit from it. But the beauty of permanent life insurance is that even while you are still living, you can cash out of your policies. And for temporary, it's maybe 10 years, 20 or 30. But permanent covers you for essentially the rest of it like what you have to do much. And then another beauty is that your investment continues to grow tax sheltered. And when you get out of benefits, you use it for whatever you like, for retirement plans, for whatever purpose. And this money comes to you tax-free and doesn't affect your earnings if you run at retirement because the government does not count that as your income. And what are the factors that you think can contribute to your insurance premium. People, some people will say, oh, it's very expensive. to go to normal, but if you can go to Tim Hortons, if you can go to KFC, McDonald's, you have Amazon Prime, Netflix, and all the rest of things you can absolutely afford life insurance. Your age, your gender, the policy coverage, and your health status, and lifestyle. Okay a big factor in your life insurance premium. And I like to say that today you should get protection, not only for yourself, but for your loved ones too, because this changes our thing to life, makes you more confident and at peace, knowing that adequate provision has been made in case of health problems, disability, or even premature death. Think of it like your phone, once you're ordering a new phone, what do you order with it? Your screen protector, your pouch, because any mistake will happen and you don't want it breaking up or shattering. So let us apply the same principle to our life. And I'm going to be ending now it's a story because life insurance for me is close to the heart. I was just at the age of five when I lost my college. And I remember while growing up, my dad would always say that she made provision. So this for you, know, I standing before you might have been a different woman, and I've had a different story, but because that provision was made, and I'm thankful for that. So I'd like to ask today that, especially my audience, the parents and children, they have dreams, they have goals, they have aspirations, can you confidently say that these goals, these dreams are going to be fulfilled without financial or mental health issues, if anything should happen to you too? Thank you very much. This one I'm going to get it in for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great chance. This is financials. <laughs> so, this um, goes online. 
you have a question, let's, let's start with the online. Um, please, if you have a question, just, just type in. I think you have some comments. Okay. 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 No, no, no question. question. Okay. Is there any question? Thank you, Rainana. Wow. So, do we have any question in house? Okay, yes. That means question. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very, very informative um, speech. Um, you mentioned one of your slides, you mentioned that um, the agenda actually is one of the things that are affecting females, and that, uh, that females pay lesser premiums than male counterparts. I mean, I I know that I have a lot of policy, but I don't have a lot. So that's it for me. And, and uh, it's great that I got to pick that up. I learned that today. So, my question is that um, if, if this is the case, if it is the case that they pay less premium, does it mean that their contribution towards their insurance, um, that they also get less of that, or does it amount to equal? Um, I mean, if they are, I mean, what they get from it rather that they get for uh, benefits. Okay, thank you very much, Debbie. I would say that females pay less because life expectancy in Canada for females is actually more than the male counterparts. So see this way that a 45-year-old woman with no health issues, non-smoker, perfect lifestyle and another 45 year old man. So when the insurance company expresses both of them, they are going to say, okay, the cost of insuring this person. So the woman might be paying, let's say $50, just hypothetically, every month, while the male counterpart pays, let's say $70, considering life expectancy. I have a colleague who told me say, oh, the women are always sending the men to the grocery shops and then we don't make them live long. But that's the reality in Canada that women live longer generally than men. And to answer your question about what it is at the end, so I would say the rate at which the man's pre uh, policy is growing, so let's say it's grows to 500,000, 300, within a certain number of years, that is the same rate as which the woman's policy is also going. So you don't get lesser benefits or lesser payouts in one of the maturity. But they are meant to pay more because generally women are better than men. So in other words, we need to take care of our men better. <laughs> yeah. So that they are not part of the statistics so that they live yeah. a relatively long life. Thank you. If I still this is not good. Yeah, um, I thought that insurance for men is more expensive. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the insurance company don't want to lose money. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Do we have another question? No question. Okay, so um, to take us further, we'll have um, um, our next topic and our next presenter. The next topic will be on um, nutrition and mental health. Visual work for this title, the God Brain Connection. And um, the person that will be taking us, the, the speaker today will be, um, let's welcome Tyan. Pro, just pardon me. <laughs> Pro, man, 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 man. Perfect, you got it. You got so, it. <laughs> pardon for the pronunciation, please. But um, she's Tyan. Let's welcome her to give us a presentation on the god brain connection. So, and um, please, for the emphasis of time, um, you have approximately 30 minutes for this presentation, and that includes um, the question and answers. So please, and please let's put the hands together. Thank you. I just, I have a little bit of slides, so I don't know if you guys have them, but I can also share my screen if you want. Oops. 
So just let me know if you have the slide there. I'll just wait to see it up there. Okay, so I'll go ahead and share. I see that I'm host now. So just one moment. So, everyone can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So in the title that was presented, um, it was, oh, let me just see. You can all see my slide? No. No? Okay, just one second here. Let me know if you could see my, oh. It said host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, I got it back. I see I'm host now. Okay, just one second. Okay, now we're good, yeah? Okay, I'm gonna assume it's all good. I didn't hear anything otherwise. Okay, great, thank you. So my name is Tanya Trefamenkoff. You did a great job saying my name. It's all good. It's a, <laughs> a lot of people struggle with it, it's fine. Um, so the gut brain connection. So that's something that I, um, kind of focus on in nutrition. Um, I'm going to maybe touch on it just a little bit, but for the purpose of today, it'll be more focused on digital mental health benefits and things you need to know as counselor or, or client, because personally, as a client, I wish I knew a bunch of things I'm going to share with you today to just protect your own mental health journey. Um, so I'm a holistic nutrition counselor and owner of DNC Wellness, and that was founded in 2021. Um, and you can find me at dncwellness.com, where my, you can see my email, send me any questions, reach out. Um, I hold workshops for corporations, um, speaking like here with BBPN, and I just thank you for inviting me to speak about this topic today. Um, and so let's get started. So just the quick agenda is uh, we're going to talk about the benefits of digital mental health for a client and coach counselor, the difference between a coach, counselor, consultant, and mentor, and client rights to information, confidentiality, and forms to sign, and a quick summary. So the benefits. So for the client, um, there's no need for transportation. You stay in the comfort of your home. Um, accessible with a phone or computer, um, and there's more opportunity to meet a counselor sooner than later, and it's easier to shop for a counselor, and I'll, I'll explain what that means, um, and there's also access to sliding scale opportunities. Um, so when shopping for a counselor, it's very important as a client to know that it's your journey, um, and to trust yourself. If something feels off in the session, you're not quite comfortable with this person, that's okay. Not every counselor is a good match for a client and vice versa. Um, so that's one thing that I wish I knew um, previously. It's very important. And there's also something called a sliding skill. And with the previous uh, presentation, it's very helpful because financial strain can be a real thing. And there are opportunities for free counseling. There's some resources like what was shared earlier as well online. But um, for me, I'm talking mostly um, about my own personal practice where I do have one-on-one -on -one sessions online. There's a sliding scale. So that means, and this is as a client, you can ask and inquire, do you do sliding scale? Because I can only afford, let's say, $50 an hour instead of 100 And sometimes the counselor will meet the client where they're at. And then when they can afford more, then they can just slide up to what the full amount is. So that's an option for clients. And for the coach counselor, the benefit of digital mental health would be reaching clients across the globe, working from home, flexible hours, no need to rent an office space and added career opportunity. So these are key differences that clients need to know because this way for their own mental health journey, they're able to really get the service that they're looking for and the reason why I'm talking about coach, counselor, consultant, and mentor is just really about kind of the field I specialize in. So that's what this whole presentation is around. 
um, and I do nutrition as well. So there's kind of a gray zone with nutrition because there is a little bit of advice giving, but we'll get we'll get into that. So for the coach, they focus more on present and future problem solving for the client. So I, I'm a certified life skills coach as well. And, and a lot of people can call themselves a coach out there. It's very important to verify their credentials and if they've studied somewhere. Um, so, so we'll talk about that too later in future slides. But dipping in the past at, with the coach can happen, but the focus needs to return to the present and the future. So if you're someone looking for managing present situation and future situations, this is definitely for you to have a coach uh, work on your goals. And the client is the lead of the session. So any advice that's been being given, that should be kind of a red flag. Um, if a coach is telling you how to manage your finances or how to, to kind of apply for jobs that you like or whatever in your lifestyle or your family, any advice, that would be, that would be a concern if a coach tells you what to do. And also for counselors, counselors focus on exploring the client's past emotional experiences. And there's a lot more sitting with the past and how they might be informing the present. And in this case as well, the client is in charge of the session. So it's important as a client to know your power in session. And so with consultants and mentors, they do share with the client some solutions, but still not all the solutions because there needs to be room for kind of considering that the client is the expert of their life. So the consultant provides guidance for the client to meet specific goals. And usually once the goal is met, they can discontinue their relationship until maybe the client wants another specific goal met. And so it's usually a shorter relationship. Um, and for the mentor, it's not like consultants. So the mentor might not work on specific goals, but kind of just walks alongside the client as they improve whatever they want. Um, they can also share their own life experience with the client. So they have kind of relatable um, experience and impart some, some life skills and um, to the client. So here's some key aspects for clients, um, especially digitally. Um, they have a right to know the coach client, the coach counselor's credentials. Cause you know, when you go in person, you see all their credentials on the walls, they're all framed. You know, I went to this school and, and everything is very clear. Um, so online, you can't see that. So you, as a client, it's very important to, if it's not on their website to, to say, hey, you can say, can I see your schooling? You know, do you have a, a piece of paper to show me um, where you studied? Because um, again, especially in the coaching um, industry, if someone calls themselves, themselves a life coach, they, that name is not regulated. So they can call themselves a life coach without the, the studies. Um, so just to kind of keep in mind as client that you can ask for those papers to see them, um, especially if you're looking for, um, well, for yourself and for your child, you can ask to see their criminal record check. And for children, there's a vulnerability check as well, which is crucial if someone owns their own business, especially like me. It's a requirement and, and I can share that with clients. Um, they also have a right to access their session notes. So let's say I'm taking notes for a client, they can see those notes, that's their right. Um, very important too, as a client in the past, I remember I used to, kind of really put my life in these counselors hands is like they know the best they they know everything like I if I'm uncomfortable it's okay you know but no the client has a right to stop sessions at any time to voice concerns to ask for referrals to other coaches or counselors if the client's not satisfied and the relationship's not working out um, and to ask for sliding scale and it may or may not be possible but they can ask so for confidentiality and forms to sign, here are things to look for as a client. Um, so the, the confidentiality should be very clearly stated before any session is happening by the coach or counselor. 
And the only times that it would be breached, which it should also be communicated, is when a coach or counselor suspects harm to self or others by order of the court, um, or if the client is endangering a vulnerable group. And uh, let's see, I just brought someone in. I admitted someone. <laughs> I hope that's fine. And um, so then one thing to remember for clients is that you have a right to confidentiality in your digital sessions. Um, and the coach counselor needs to share with the client that they're in a secure, quiet location with no, no other observers or listeners present in the room. So that's one thing when you're not in person, you can't see the room, you can't see what's going on around the person. Um, the counselor's responsibility is to say, this is a private room, nobody's here, it's a safe space. Um, if you do, as a client, see someone walking around, that's not that's not keeping with confidentiality. And immediately, as a client, should say something about it. Maybe it's not a counselor for you if there's that trust already broken. Um, so those are things to watch for as a client. Um, and these forms are very important to sign before any kind of session. Um, and I'll tell you why. So the informed consent and waiver the coaching and counseling agreement and the intake form. So informed con consent and waiver it really just kind of informs the client what they're getting into, what the risks might be, and kind of outline the responsibility of the client and the responsibility of the coach counselor. Um, so these are very important forms. And the intake form is, so it can be different for every, every um, practitioner, every different type of uh, coach or counselor um, it can look different and for nutrition like for my practice it might include pages and pages of whole body health right are you having allergies and all these details and the client can choose to not answer those questions or answer as much as they want just remembering that there's a freedom in these relationships and to always remember to be comfortable as a client doing those things and any questions to go ahead and ask. So just as a summary, as the client, you it's important to know your rights to information and confidentiality when especially digitally asking for that information um, for those for those papers showing that they're they have credentials um, and your power to choose who is a good match for you. Um, knowing the difference between a coach, counselor, consultant, and mentor to achieve the goals you want, make sure the person you're meeting has education um, and ask questions anytime. And as a coach counselor, it's important to ensure the room is secure to meet confidentiality requirements, um, share credentials, limits of confidentiality and assess if it is a good match with the client as well. Because sometimes let's say I'm accepting a client and it's completely not a good match we're looking for something like a mentor instead of a holistic nutrition counselor. And I also have a right to say, maybe we're not a good match. I might suggest a mentor if that's something they're looking for. So um, those are just things to keep in mind. So thank you everyone for your attention, for my little share. And I welcome any questions that you might have um, regarding the holistic nutrition um, counseling digitally and I hope this was helpful just to kind of protect client and and kind of help with the counselors also um, the importance of information being shared. Any questions anywhere? Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, I'd like to, before I, I turn it um, open for questions, I would like to ask um, if you could share with us how um, your counseling has you know, helped people. How counseling has helped people? How your counseling, yes. Yeah, okay. So, so one of the biggest things is that um, counseling, counseling addresses, um, counseling specifically dives into the past, as I mentioned. Um, and that what that does is it addresses any kind of past traumas in childhood, anything that happened in the past that might be imprinted today. One of the biggest works that I like to do is with cognitive behavioral therapy, 
I'm not a cognitive behavioral therapist, but what that, what that means is um, I can still use those skills and tools to help clients understand their past um, by the beliefs that might have been imprinted, you know, like, for example, let's say I grew up in a very racist community, and I have a belief that I'm unworthy, I have a belief that I'm less than, right? Those are beliefs that are imprinted here that I can work on with a counselor to get, get them out, replace them with new beliefs that are not limiting me and that can expand my life today. So it's about kind of diving in the past, seeing what might be limiting me today, but by doing that past work as a counselor, um, even in nutrition as well, because it's a holistic approach. You're talking physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, all those levels together to kind of really support the present today. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's a question. Is it question? Online. If you have a question, please have the opportunity to ask. Okay, no questions. Great, we just want us to do everything and we have taken some lessons from them. All right, let's put our hands together. And then we just move to the next presentation. And in this section, we'll be inviting um, a youth speaker. <laughs> She's going to be sharing her experience. So um, she's uh, with the journey with Boys and Girls Club. So let's put our hands together. So, okay, so um, good afternoon and evening, distinguished guests, friends and family. My name is Ipti, and I'm a grade 10 student at Bernie's Big Bottom High School. I'm beyond grateful to be given the platform to share my thoughts and opinions about mental health awareness for BIPOC youth. Mental illness does not discriminate. While non-white people experience relatively similar rates of mental illness as white people, they face glaring disparities when it comes to accessing mental health help. Research has shown that BIPOC groups are less likely to have access to mental health services, less likely to seek out treatment, more likely to receive lower poor quality of care, and more likely to end services early. The pandemic has critically strained an already overburdened system, magnifying existing shortcomings of the mental health system, including inequitable availability, access, and quality of care for the Black, Indigenous, and people of color community. BIPOC continue to be disproportionately affected emotionally and physically by the virus, experiencing more hospitalizations and greater mortality rates, as well as increased emotional distress. These losses are occurring against the backdrop of inequities due to systemic racism, including long-standing disenfranchisement of the health care system, historic trauma, stigma, high cost of cultural sensitivity, which may put BIPOC communities at highest risk for not receiving mental health care. These barriers have persisted in the wake of prior disasters, preventing BIPOC communities from accessing and utilizing mental health treatment after national tragedies. Digital mental health tools like mobile apps could play a key role in expanding access to care for those most impacted by COVID-19 and systemic racism by providing remote assessment, support, or intervention, lowering the cost of mental health care, reducing transportation challenges, in providing care in a private and destigmatizing manner. The social impact movement on youth mental health with youth mental health wellness with IPTI offers five key recommendations on how the mental health care and technology fields can react to ensure the development of approaches that increase health equity by increasing R real work evidence, E educating consumers and providers, A utilizing adaptive interventions to optimize care, C creating for diverse populations and team building trust. Summer of 2021, I participated in an entrepreneurship program at the Moncton Bulls and Girls Club was offering and created a business in which my goal was to aid teens in getting well-rounded advice on everything from school to social, to social related issues and everything in between. I presented the idea to a jury and won $50 as a startup. 
I believe that mental health problems is not defined who you, who you are. They are something you experience. You walk in the rain, you feel the rain, but you are not the rain. Mental health is not a destination but a process. It's about how you drive along where you're going. Thank you. I'd like you to stay here because, like I said earlier, he is one of, of the youth out there that inspired this seminar we are having today. There, I think it was in 2021, we had this meeting and she, I got talking with her around the projects after she walked, she presented to the grand jury at the Boys and Girls Club of uh, Mountain. She's got this brilliant idea as an immigrant, as a child of an immigrant, a person of color that has, you know, at certain points in time, you know, faced certain things that literally make people say to yourself, do I really belong here? And like Tanya said something before, sometimes there are some things that has happened in our past that literally makes us to start questioning our self-worth. And it was so, I, I, I connected with that idea as a youth because what we all do here today, we as immigrants we educated because we wanted our youth, our children to have that life that surpasses our lives. And we want to do everything possible to also let them know that they are worthy in the new environment they find themselves. And it's so shocking and encouraging to see that, you know, an immigrant child, a youth in our own closet already understand that this existed. And I just don't want to sit on the fence and do nothing. I want to do something. So we decided to talk and ideas, social impact movements with Ipsy literally came through that mentorship. And I'm so excited that even though I think she's shy, she's just reading, and, but I think the time gets to you know, um, go with the flow. And but before you leave, I just wanted to talk briefly about your presentation to the Boys and Girls Club of St. John. And I know that was what you did. We don't have to do that. Thank you. Um, so, summer 2021, my mom forced me to go through an entrepreneurship program that the Boys and Girls Club of London was offering. Um, at first, I was really reluctant to go because I didn't think it would add much value to me. I didn't think it was important. I'd rather spend my summer sleeping in or like doing stuff with my friends. But I'm very happy that she did encourage me or like make me go because I feel like it has helped me a lot into where I am today and it's helped me get a better grip of what I want to do in the future and better understand who I am now. Um, the whole point was to create a business and they gave us basic entrepreneurship skills and on how to uh, make that business. It was also a majority of immigrants that were actually attending the program with me, including Percy. Um, so the whole point was just to create a business that will aid, aid a society of immigrants and a group of people. It could either be a product or a service, but I was one of the few people who chose to do a service because I feel like um, we need less materialistic things in society and we need more movement and we need a lot more things to help better the community. So I decided and I went with something, I went with a project that would try to give well-rounded advice to teenagers everywhere, anywhere, no matter where you're from, who you are, or what, where you come from, whatever background you are, just if you're a teenager, if you're a human being, um, just to give you well rounded advice on anything from school to future and to social issues and everything in between, because um, there's very limited resources where, as a teenager, I do know that, that there's very limited resources to who you can go to for non-biased, well-rounded advice. And the whole point of it was it's going to be anonymous. So you just go in there. No one would know your name, what you look like. And you just tell them your problems. And then you get advice no matter where you come from, no matter who you are, just so it's a non-biased. Um, yeah, it's a non-biased system. And you're just able to get what you need and implement that into your life. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Why not?
So sometimes, you know, we get people that tend to make us do what we usually don't want to do, but in the long run, find out that this has really impacted, it has really improved me. So um, the most important thing is to, you know, have those guidance around because if you don't have guides, then you're definitely not really going to go far. So um, guide is very important, just like mom guide. And she didn't know it was very good to also, but today she's enjoying herself and she's so fun about what she has been you know, able to achieve. So please, let's put, put a hand to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I don't know if you have any question. Do we have any question for her? She knows what she's doing. She knows what she's doing. So don't, don't think that she wouldn't be able to answer any question. She can. Please do. I'm interested in the car, but she said something about the car. And I just want to encourage her to support it. So where are we with the car? What support do you require? It was just to know, like, it wasn't really like how I'm going to develop an app. It was more of just like an idea just to put it out there that something that would be beneficial. And it has five different components, like I said, where it's the ask to be developed problems that it's based with mental health. So it was just how mobile apps in general would aid mental health illness and just help people get the support that they need. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I mentor her honestly, and as I say, everything that she has brought to the table is all about our new experiences. And this is the way to go because it's not just to say to the next, but we should follow that. So right now, she's putting our ideas together, she's conducting the social research, and also we get to that point where we have this holistic picture. You know, we don't want to go into you know, Development is not still in the Asian Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, um, I would also like to add she needs every support that anyone can give her, organizations everywhere. So, wherever you're listening from, if you think that there's something you can do to support it, to enable her, you know, achieve her goal, you know, help the, the BIPOC community, ensuring that everybody gets the kind of uh, you know, advice they need. You know, to, to you know, tackle any form of mental challenges they are going through. I think it is someone that we can really impress them. And I uh, appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, the mom has something to say. Let's give her an opportunity. So, the first one, it was to just uh, give her advice for PT. PT um, likes to stay more in her colors. Very event that I think that's going to be part of it. I like to say, hey, go. And she's like, no, why do you have to go home? I don't have to do that. So, but to her, she feels like I'm forcing her and her mental health doesn't say she has to do it. But anywhere she gets to, she gets to make an impact and she comes back and says, oh, mom, thank you for forcing me. So it's just to say that when our kids come home to say, oh, I don't want to do this, it takes my way, she takes my that, it's because we are not seeing the bigger picture, or because we are seeing what is our age. And that is why Mira, she uses the word, she's always possible. For everything that I said, she like this program that I came for. I'm going to get a day off after I have a program that I want to see this thing or two. And I'm glad to see that, yeah, she comes to me and I came to her to do something. Thank you. Thank you. So, what about seeing the person? Because that's what I was telling you about. It's about 18. The mom saw that she has that, um, um, you know, energy. She has that, you know, strength in her. She can pick up something. She's creative, and she encourages her to go.
come out of our comments. And that is why we are today. This program that we're building today is in the like and the like is, you know, originated from that. The idea came from that. So imagine if she didn't go for that for that program, wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have met um, uh, Erica and others as well. So let's just put our hands together again. Yeah, right. We're taking the ball for Sita. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. So um, we're going to be uh, welcoming our next speaker today. And um, our speaker will be talking about the impact of real time visual consultation on mental health of children, youths, adults, and families. And um, we'll be welcoming a professional in the um, health industry. And um, it's not a person in the opportunity of Pantaku. Um, let's put our hands together. He's online. So he'll be joining us to give us a presentation. And Mr. Tunde, Dr. Tunde, sorry. Dr. Tunde is a medical practitioner, clinical consultant, and CEO of Psych Canada. So let's put our hands together as a welcome. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, for, for the invitation. Um, currently, I'm signed in on the on a mobile device. Can can someone please let me in? I have a second device. Yeah, right. Um, while while we are doing that, um, just want to say thank you to to everyone um, for putting together this um, this seminar. Um, con congratulations um, to Black Business Professionals Network. Right. Uh, okay. Let's. Um, your email. Yes, that's 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 much better. Now, let me. Uh, all right. This this is this is much better. All right. I've been I've been following following the last three speakers. Right, starting from the financial. The, the, the financial um, talk, then we went to the nutrition talk, and um, the younger lady too, who did an awesome job, you know, talking about the next generation, right? Um, well, well, well done. It's a great privilege to, you know, to be here. Right. Um, I don't have sharing privilege yet. If you, if you want to do that for me, you can share now, sir. I can. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ex excellent. Okay. So we we are we are there. All right. So thank you um, for all all the organizers, all the supporters, right? That is making this to to happen. Um, I'm really, really delighted. I'm not sure if this is the first time this is hosting or this is happening in this community, but certainly this is the first time that I'm I'm being a part of this, right? And um, the the last three speakers, you know, from talking from the financial lady, then to the lady that spoke about nutrition, right? Um, I've done a great job, so I will be putting together, you know, and borrowing quite a number of your words. So if you, you know, if you hear me say certain things you mentioned, just notice that, um, yes, it is it is your words and I took that from you. All right, um, let's put this into a little bit of context. I think I have about 20, 30 minutes thereabouts. So just to help with time, um, I will go. <laughs> 
Okay. So um <clears throat> just to help with um you know uh, all right. I have uh, I have lost the sharing privileges again. Okay, it's back. Thank you. All right. So just to let's dive in quickly to put some context because um, when we're talking about um, you know black professionals, um, we shouldn't shy away from you know certain context that needs to be talked about. And um, yeah, so let's look at you know latest latest studies um, you know Canada, Canada statistics right referencing mental health particularly during the COVID situation. Right, because it's with the COVID, you know, COVID pandemic that brought about the boom, the, the, the boom in virtual, virtual healthcare. Virtual healthcare has always been there, right, since um, the year 2000, uh, 2000, 2002, you know, but with the COVID, it opened things, it took it to a bigger scale. Right now, let's now narrow it down to um, blacks. You know, black visible minority population in 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 Canada. You know, as you will see from mental health perspective, right? The black visible minorities are reporting that they struggle um, significantly with poorer, you know, um, mental health compared to um, white participants. Um, the same thing would go um, when you're looking at um, depression, anxiety, right? Um, close to, you know, um, nine, if not 10%, right? Um, more for Black people struggle with depression and anxiety compared to, to um, the white counterparts in the study um, during, during the pandemic. And the lady that talked about financial security, right? Um, I, I, I talked about you know how to harness um, your finance, your financial wealth, insurance, you know, and all that, which is great, right? Um, that is because at huge proportion, you know, close to about fifteen percent, right? Um, disproportion um, disparity between the blacks and the whites, you know, when it comes to financial insecurity, that is quite significant. You know, any, any statistical figure that is greater than 10% is quite significant, right? So um, no doubt about it, the black visible um, minority population in Canada has struggled significantly with their mental health through, you know, through the COVID, right? And now, then brings us to um, surveys of um, you know black Canadian residents. Um, you know when we look at um, men, 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 mental health, right? Sixty percent of them of um, black Canadians are willing to access mental health services if um, the mental health professional were you know is a black individual. Let's pack that. Just note that statement and pack it aside. Um, we will. I will come back to that statement in in a little while and why that statement is very important. Um, but on 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 the flip side, you know, more than thirty percent, at least one in every three, right, Black Canadians is experiencing significant psychological distress. Right, and of that one in three, another one in three of those, right, would not would not seek out mental health services, right. And why? I will speak to that in you know in a few in a few minutes. Um, but look at this overwhelming figure, right, close to one hundred percent, more than ninety percent, right. That is nine out of every ten Black Canadians right feel that um the mental health services um is being underutilized right feel that the underutilization of mental health services by black canadian is an issue and it needs to be addressed 
right? Um, I can say that for sure in my clinic, right? Um, maybe out of all um, the, the, the clients that I have, and it's a big practice, right? Um, maybe it's about one in every hundred um, you know, black Canadians use use the use 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 the services, right? So <clears throat> it is not that um, as as black Canadians we're not struggling with mental health issues, but the question is why is this significant on the on the utilization, right? So <clears throat> since we are speaking to um, professionals, right? I think it's better to just look at this from entrepreneurial viewpoint, you know, because entrepreneurs, business people, what you are looking for is what are the problems, right? And how can you provide solutions to those problems that will bring value to the community, right? That is my understanding of, you know, and um, an entrepreneur. So for the you know business and professionals on this network, right? Um, I hope my talk will be able to you know um, help you start to put on your business right um, heart, um, you know, and mind and brainstorming right on how to address some of these problems you know for 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 us. So number one problem and where digital mental health, particularly virtual treatment as, you know, um, provided um, uh, a solution to the barrier is in number one, the area of resources. Um, right across all board from the Atlantic Canada to the Pacific Canada, right, there is the problem of family physicians. Um, and of course, unfortunately, Black persons in Canada are more likely to experience the challenges of finding Black, um, sorry, finding um, family physicians. And it's even more difficult for the newcomers, the newcomers to Canada. I prefer to use the terminology newcomers because everyone in Canada, right, whether you're first generation or fifth generation, you are a migrant. Right, the original people on ground were the um, the natives. So the newcomers, um, particularly in the black um, community, right, even find it more challenging. Now, let me tell you a story, and this story will help you, you know, put put these connections together. As you're aware, um, I'm a psychiatrist, so I I have a, a, a psychiatric clinic. Now. Um, an individual, right, in British Columbia who happens to also be, you know, um, a Canadian of African descent and origin is struggling with mental mental illness, but could not access um, psychiatric services in British Columbia, right? Now that is because the family physician that he has, right, is quite a distance away. Now, <laughs> connected with um, a member of the family who happens to be a family physician, right, in another part of Canada, who connected with me in Atlantic Canada. So now we've crossed three provinces, right? And how do we address or help this, you know, individual? Um, <clears throat> The individual that he connected with happens to be a pastor, right? Um, so the pastor was concerned about this young man's um, mental health, right? Reached out to me, you know, as a psychiatrist, as look, Dr. Tunde, what can you do to help in this capacity? I was like, okay, great, right? Um, before, before the COVID pandemic, there was nothing I could do, right? It's either he flies down, to New Brunswick, or I fly down over there, or we connect on telephone, right? Whichever way, um, but it will be a substandard treatment. I wouldn't even get involved, right? But on this occasion with virtual treatment, real-time video conference, where it, the three of us were able to connect and have a three, you know, um, 
a three-way video conference consultation, right, for this young man in British Columbia, right, by tele, you know, telehealth services. So like that, it was easy and okay to, um, to break that barrier, um, <clears throat> to break that barrier and um, provide this, in, this young man who was somewhere in the north, in the remote part of, um, of British Columbia, where I understand the population in that community was about 10,000, right? And he was concerned, you know, that um, if, if he talks about his mental health in the community, he's likely to be discriminated against, you know, and, and, and all that. But so with, with, the, with the impact, you know, of um, telehealth, um, telemedicine, telepsychiatry, virtual, you know, real-time video conference, it was easy to break that barrier. And, you know, the good thing is, um, again, we're able to, to, you know, to relate, to discuss with his family, right? And um, the young man is doing fantastically well, um, you know, and he's back in his job, he's doing what he loves doing as an IT professional, you know, and, um, and all that. So those, those resources, um, those lack of resources, right? Um, digital medicine, digital health has been able, you know, to bridge um, the, the, the wider community to make it a little bit more global, and it makes it easier for people to work together, right, within any existing existing community. Now, the second thing that we also need to talk about, particularly in within the black um, community, right, is the problem of, you know, focus on prevention and the lack of education, right? Um, without sparing words at all, we are not doing a good job in that um, area. And that is because we have a very, very limited um, mental health literacy compared to um, the white, white Caucasian population. So as a result, quite a number of people um, in the Black community is very guarded, right? Um, and they are closed up and they don't want to have conversation or they have find conversations about mental health very challenging. And that is because of, um, of the stigma, right? No one likes to be stigmatized. No one wants to be stigmatized. But if you know, we can reduce the um, scope, right, of stigma, then it is way easier, right, to improve um, people's help-seeking behaviors and attitudes towards accessing mental health, right? So how does digital um, virtual, virtual um, medicine, you know, um, how does that come in now? Of course, within families, Inside of families, um, mental health, particularly when you start to hear about psychiatric conditions, you know, it's considered a taboo, you know, God forbid. You would now start to hear things like God forbid. Well, which is true, no, no one wants to go, you know, experience that, but there are different stages, you know, of, um, of um, mental, of psychological disturbances. An individual who is stressed, right, who is um, overwhelmed, right, is going through a mental health distress, right? Um, it is not until the individual, you know, is schizophrenic or psychotic, right, or, man or manic, you know, and they are not together in terms of their thinking faculties. That is, you know, the extreme of psychiatric illness, illness condition. So, how has virtual virtual um, care helped us, right? Um, in the last in the last um, maybe I would say eighteen months, right? I have held several talks, right, and several seminars, several education, several interviews, right, across um, various. Um, 
um, black communities, um, particularly churches, particularly um, business organizations, right? Talking about mental health. And I do not have to leave the confines of my home. Sometimes I'm in my bedroom, right? Um, and having this education, right? Helping to improve um, the level of um, education for or within the Black community such that people will find um, mental health issues, you know, less challenging and less stigmatized. Now, the other one is actually if you're a Christian or if you're a Muslim, right, or you're a Catholic, um, now with the with the virtual platform it is actually even easier to bring a professional right into into your trusted um community um spaces such that the 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 the, the, the professional can help right um minimize those fears and concerns of um you know of the of the black community where it comes to you know the context of look if 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 i disclose or if i come out and i share my mental health you know challenges with um the, with with my pastor with my imam um or with my you know with my faith leader um then um that will be that could be seen as if i don't have enough you know enough faith right or i'm not a person of faith it has nothing to do, you know, to do with that. Um, there are there are examples, several examples in the Bible, right? And I can speak from um, the Bible Bible context of um, mental illness, right? In the Bible, and that they, that were you know that were um, dealt dealt with, right? So, what I a take home point um, from here for for those listening to me is that anyone struggling with mental illness should be supported, right? And they shouldn't be castigated, um, you know, um, on 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 the grounds of the, of their faith. Now, the final point I want to mention on this slide um, is the is the poor understanding of confidentiality. Right. Um, of course, within the black community, we tend to have a closely niche, you know, niche, 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 niche to one. Right. And people don't understand um, what is, you know, what is confidentiality and saying that even though I am a professional, right, whatever you disclose to me when it comes to your health, right. Um, stays within the doctor and the patient or client relationship. So I am ethically bound professionally not to divulge that information to anyone, right? So if in your community, you're having um, a physician or a nurse, you know, or a social worker, right? Those people understand, those professionals understand the, 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 the extent and the ethics, um, professional ethics um, of confidentiality. So those are people that you can reach out to, right? But again, if you're concerned that the, that the familiarity is too close for comfort, right? To disclose, you know, mental health challenges, we can always utilize the virtual platforms, right? And I hope, you know, as um, professionals on this line, you'll be able to find a way on how to and as all, you know, all this, um, all this wealth, right? That we would have bring all the professionals together, right? Such that we can improve. Um, um on educating the black the black community right and bring us up to speed right regarding our mental health literacy and knowledge now um that brings us to you know staffing issues right and i think it was one of the one of the last three speakers was actually talking about um coach right um in 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 mental health particularly people seeking to you know seeking to um utilize the mental mental health services um the concern of stigma is there the concern of um discrimination is there even beyond that 
majority are entirely new and they don't know how to navigate the system, right? You can, you, take advantage of this. And I hope again, someone who is a professional, you know, can start to think, you know, about how to set up an agency, right? That would um, help people, right? Um, facilitate um, the coach network professionals such that an individual that wants to go to um, a psychiatric clinic, for example, right um and they don't know how to go about it can always connect right with a peer support coach right who can then walk them through um their own real life experiences right and help them see how they can um put together their story right put together their challenge yeah. right in in um a well um, in a well reasonable way, in such a way that um, the professional can understand the language, right, of the service user and vice and vice versa, right. I think this would go a long way, right, in helping a lot of people to feel more comfortable about using um, mental health mental health services, right? And understanding what mental health treatment and process is, um, is all, all about. Now, the final slide, um, again, is this is actually speaking more to the younger girl that um, spoke, you know, bef before me. Um, and it is quite, um, this is quite something that I see right, right across um, all ages, right? So it's not just the younger population, even the older um, Black community will struggle day in, day out with perceived, right, injustice. And this cultural biases, um, sometimes they are not intentional, but they are already within our subconscious because it is things that we have carried through, right, over, over the years. So issues like um, trauma, historical and intergenerational trauma, right, affects a lot of people and makes them feel unsafe. Right when you get into the community, into, into a situation or into a system where you happen to be a visible minority, a visible minority. Now, what is this visible minority? Look at my bullet point there, right? In the United States, right? Ap approximately right, for not up to 4%, just approaching 4% of psychologists and mental health therapists are Blacks, right? So there is a huge disparity there, right? That the same thing goes for here in Canada, right? Like I, I meet young people, right? Young um, Black people and they're saying, look, Dr. Tunde, I want to tell, I, I want a therapist. And I am not a therapist, I'm a psychiatrist. I don't do therapy, right? I help with diagnosis and I help with medication management, right? But I need a counselor, I need a therapist that will understand my culture, that will understand my context and understand my journey where I'm coming from, right? And as I speak, Right, I don't know of any one, any one individual, right, that does that in in the old entire the entirety of New Brunswick, right. The only lady that I know that is black, right, and understands um, that is of African descent and understands this, right, is only is practicing in you know in Nova Scotia, right. But you see. Of those surveyed, now getting back to my earlier story, right, of those people that we talked about that are willing to access, right, at least two in every three saying they are willing to speak to a professional, right, a mental health professional 
if they are black, right? So that in itself speaks a lot of. Okay, can I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead. All right, okay. So um, re remember, remember, you know, um, is it a proverb? I don't know whether it's a proverb or something. It's teaching time saves nine, right? That should that should always be our approach to to mental health. Okay. Um, the more the moment that you are concerned, right, then reach out for help. Now. The way it's designed in uh, in New Brunswick and right across Canada, um, psychiatrist is a specialty, so you cannot just you know go to see a psychiatrist. That's where family physicians they are like the gateway physician. Now, if you if your child or if the child or the family doesn't have a family physician. Um, that can be a challenge, right? But the interesting thing is any family physician right across Canada can send a referral to a psychiatrist, right? That's, that is number one, right? Now, number, number two um, is P, for, for children, right, pediatricians, um, can send a referral to a psychiatrist so that the psychiatrist can access the services, right? Now, also, um, therapists or psychologists can send a referral, right, to, to a psychiatrist so that the, the, the family can access the services, right? And that was why, again, I was highlighting the points that number one, within the within the black community, there is the challenge of um, family physician, right? That's one. And even within within that, we're talking about um, therapies. There is no therapist that looks like me, right? So I don't feel confident reaching out to you know, the therapy services, right? So again, um, uh, I'm not utilizing what, what is available on ground, right? So to answer your question, right, um, there, there are stages that needs, as of today, there are stages that need to be, to, be, to, be, to be crossed, right? Family physicians, pediatricians, you know, um, therapists, counseling therapists or psychologists, you can go to those ones. They will do the initial um, intake assessment. They will listen and then advise you should this be escalated to, to the specialist level or not, right? However, um, if we are able to come up with a network, right, um, our own network, right, um, that makes it easier to break, you know, all those all those barriers so that it is easier. Um, for people to navigate the system, instead of going serially, you know, we can then go parallel, um, which I think it's um, it's uh, it's will, will, will be a better way, right, to provide um, to be reachable, um, and then provide services to families that need it. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Tinder. I appreciate that. The response to that question. Um, to take us um, further, we are going to be welcoming our next speaker. We're going to be welcoming our next speaker, and she'll be talking on the topic. Digital and mental health awareness, literacy focusing on Bible views in Mountain. And um, we'll be welcoming Felix as shown on for our presentation. And uh, Felix, you have five minutes. I would like you to.
Thank you so much, the organizers of this program. This is a very important and integral part of our community uh, mental health. I call it the fourth talk. And it is a privilege for me to be speaking on this topic. Why? Because it's my passion. And I also want to thank the other speakers who have been speaking. And my special thanks to Ibiti. Ibiti, you made my day. Really? <laughs> because this is where my passion lies. If given the truth and force in the community, that's that's what I'm doing. So my name is uh, Feda Sh and Feda Shekwa is the father of the Pyoko Foundation. Pyoko Foundation is a registered not-for-profit um, organization in Nicosia, Canada, and Ottawa. We are focused on empowering the youth with the right mindset to be just like this, to be very creative, to be productive, and our mission really to raise mentally, emotionally, morally, and spiritually sound, very, very important. And when I talk about being innovative and being creative and being productive, you will agree with me. For any youth to do this, they need to have a stable mind. If you don't have a stable mind, it's very, it's not realistic to be innovative and productive and willing to. Uh, to think. And so why do we do what we do? Why do we have this? Why is it? I have had the interaction with a lot of youth, especially with the black community. And from my previous interactions with the youth, my team and myself, we have identified some root cause of mental instability among the black youth. And this causes the great flow, lack of self lack of self-esteem. The youth complain that they do not have a safe place where they can express themselves, an inadequate community where they can collaborate and where they can engage, therefore causing a lot of instability in terms of their mental health. Expanding youth that migrated into Canada. I just feel that why we don't love this point, the real struggle with this. And this is why since December of 2020, during the pandemic, till date, Pure Gold has leveraged on using the digital space to solve this major problem in the target. We have leveraged on using digital tools like the Kahoot, like Canva, because those tools have helped engage the youth with activities that challenges their mind and brings out critical thinking skills. From what I've said so far, no. we don't diagnose mental health like medical doctors do. We don't need um, prescriptions. What we go is that we prevent mental health. We support the mental health to be very stable so that life can keep going. So, what is the impact of um, using the digital space? My next slide. I'll give you those five minutes. So I'll try to put my toes together. <laughs> so the impact of using the digital space of your world is we have been able to reach over 70 youth in New York City across other countries. Um, using our digital space to administer transformative mind teachings that support mental health and promote self-esteem. We have taught positive values to youth, telling them that if you have your values very positive, then you can get to any place you want to get to your value. They can be limited with their values. We have taught purpose, letting the youth know that everyone is unique, respective of your age, respective of your background, respective of where you are coming from, to let you know 
that they are very, very unique and authentic people that can contribute to the community. And uh, we have also discussed, we had a very major project during the summer where we had the youth read a book and review the book. And this was tailored at the battlefield of the mind. What are the battles? That the youth struggle with their mind. Pure goal has been able to identify it, to empower them with how they can deal with the battles in their mind, thereby stimulating their mental health. We have also, in Pure Goal, created a very safe place where our youth can come and express their feelings and their emotions through our emotional check without or being judged or being searched. What has we done with you in Pure Goal? We have our biweekly classes, and our biweekly classes has become a community that you are very, very excited part of. Why? Because they're able to learn, they're able to engage, and they're able to collaborate with people like themselves. We have succeeded in building a community of young people who have the awareness of their identity. If you ask my people, I have some of you. Mercy, Jerry, ask them what they, they will tell you with confidence that they are called peers. Why? That is the identity. The ability to know the identity as royals gives them a lot of self esteem. Their shoulders are to work with the community of their peers. These values are resulted to have an increase in the number of Black youth who have built self-confidence to share their ideas, to solve the issues in their community, not being intimidated by anyone. And this is confidence this replacing the sickness of the mind. We are getting future leaders ready to lead with integrity and soundness of mind. In summary, my five minutes. Youth empowerment is our strategy. We had so many issues across the field, currently and in the past. And that's why I call on government, I call on individuals, I call on entrepreneurs, I call on organizations that are looking for answers to solve the problem. Because why? We have a lot of homelessness across the world, even in our province. We have high rates of crime, crime rate among the youth. We have uh, questions around economic development and economic sustainability. And we are saying that in pure gold, we are competitors. And our answer is empower. If you empower the youth with the right mindset, you empower the family. You empower a community and you empower the entire world. So today, I'm going to end on this note that if we join us and partner with us to build a responsive, respected, creative, and productive individuals who will transform the workplace. They will build a system that can be sustained. The system that I have worked hard for, a system that you have worked hard for, a system that people in the past have worked hard for. When we back down, who will sustain it? This young generation. And I call on everyone to join me, to join me on goal, to build a community of people that will sustain our economy. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. If I didn't take anything out of it, out of this presentation, it is that the mind is the first point of empowerment. When our mind is not properly empowered, when our mind is not properly you know, focused. But it means that every other investment, every other resource that we are putting into people do not bring the actual um, return. 
So thank you so much for that presentation. I will not have any time for questions. <laughs> okay. So um, maybe we'll just go and like to um, invite um, Mamadou Aouri, he's online, to introduce himself. And uh, we just have um, a few minutes to do that. Mamadou Aouri is the president of CPD AAMB. It's um, a, a, a black community that is based here in New Brunswick. So Mamadou Aouri, if you're there, please go ahead and introduce yourself and your organization. Let's put our hands together as we welcome. So, hello everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, sorry, I would like to. J'aurais bien apprécié être dans la salle aujourd'hui pour justement célébrer cette journée avec vous. Mais je veux simplement féliciter les organisateurs Black Business Professional pour cette belle pour cette belle initiative. Euh, d'organiser justement un événement sur la santé mentale. Mon nom est Mamadou Ouri Diallo, je suis le président du Conseil provincial des personnes euh, d'ascendance africaine, un organisme qui existe depuis 2016 et nous œuvrons justement pour faire avancer les objectifs de la décennie internationale des personnes d'ascendance africaine autour des objectifs reconnaissance, justice, développement. Alors, euh, parler de la santé mentale des communautés noires euh, est pour moi un grand intérêt, mais aussi je l'aborde avec beaucoup d'inquiétude. Parce que si nous regardons les statistiques euh, de Statistique Canada, par exemple, nous sommes environ 7000 Noirs au Nouveau-Brunswick. Sur les 7000 Noirs, récemment, euh, le gouvernement du Canada a annoncé que nous sommes 800 000, euh, que la population de Nouveau-Brunswick a atteint 800 000 personnes. Donc cela euh, montre un peu la nécessité et même l'urgence pour le système de santé de se, de se pencher euh, sur la santé mentale de nos communautés noires. Euh, les gens qui immigrent, les personnes noires qui immigrent, euh, euh, qui viennent au Canada, viennent avec une différente culture. Donc, c'est important pour le système de santé de pouvoir euh, prévoir, euh, bien entendu, des façons de, de, de prendre en charge ces personnes-là africaines qui viennent, qui euh, ont grandi dans d'autres cultures où on leur dit que euh, se plaindre est un défaut, où on leur dit que se confier est un signe de, de, de faiblesse. Donc, lorsque ces gens-là arrivent avec une autre perception, euh, une autre culture, il faut que le système de santé actuel se penche et trouve des solutions pour les intégrer et même prendre en, en considération leur, euh, leurs inquiétudes. Donc, euh, je félicite bien entendu euh, Black Business Professional pour cette euh, initiative et nous rappelons aussi que nous sommes ouverts à la collaboration et à, à écouter nos amis africains, à écouter nos amis noirs qui ont des difficultés dans la communauté et qui veulent justement se faire entendre. Merci à tout le monde. Salut. Um, Erica, so give us a speech. Erica is a mountain local immigration partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you once again, Mahmoud. That was a very helpful speech, um, insightful speech that you gave. Um, and to all our speakers who have spoken today, I found um, uh, Faith from Pure Gold, very, very short or powerful speech that she gave there. Thank you once again. It was a pleasure having you. And thank you very much, Erica, for representing the city of Moncton. It's actually very honorable and a pleasure that we do have somebody from the local immigration. I mean, from the local I'm sorry, yes. From yes, from the local. Well, knowing that we have a partner, I mean, our local immigration partner here as well. Thank you so much, Erica, um, for. Lola, Dr. Tunde, um, we had we had so many so many powerful 
um, speakers today. I really wish this was a, a larger seminar. And one thing that I picked out from here was that our mental health can actually be better when we have access to information. And that, I think that's just what I'm going to go away with as, as you know, the overall information here. So I'd like to have that. Um, if we do have any questions, we can reach out to uh, the BBPN. Um, we can connect you with all the speakers that have spoken today. If you have any questions or find anybody around in your community that is challenged, um, you know, having any challenges with mental health or even general health issues, we'll be happy to support. Um, and uh, let's let's just ensure that we look out because we are a community of black professionals. So let's ensure that we look out for one another here. And um, we, without our sponsors for this event, we will not have been able to you know, be at this venue and we would not have been able to do a lot of the things that we have achieved today. So we really want to thank our sponsors for this event, TD Bank. They have really been very, very supportive. We want to thank them for all the support, all the help and uh, all the uh, things that they were able to help us achieve. We say a very big thank you to all the volunteers, everybody that was here to support and to make this event a great one. Um, we do apologize that we had gone some minutes over time. Uh, we appreciate all your time, the time that you have spent with us for those that have made it here today, those that have been online, either for a particular time or even for the beginning of the event. Once again, we say thank you for joining and um, let's continue to stay in touch. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, and uh, that brings us to the close of the event. So I'm sure we'll all have a nice time. Thank you so much. See you next time.